On Tech News Today, Google wants to put cameras in your home, Samsung wants to put a new smartwatch on your wrist, and a company called Quirky wants to put you in control of all your home appliances. All that and more coming up right now on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, June 23rd, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Apple and Android devices are worth at gazelle.com. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. My co-hosts today are Sarah Silbert of Engadget fame and also Jason Howell, who's just back from a week off exploring the Amazon. <sighs> what are you guys doing? Well... Uh, recovering. Yeah, yeah. So you were exploring the Amazon and not, course, not Amazon. The phone. Yeah, I wasn't exploring was the, the 3D. I actually wasn't even exploring Amazon. I was in Atlanta. So, so you guys uh, excited about Google I.O.? It's going to be pretty Absolutely. cool, I think. This is going to be an Android Wear week, I think. We're going to see several smartwatches, so that will be interesting. Yes, I I'm hoping to walk out of there with an arm full of smartwatches, and I'm hoping... Don't uh, hold them up, Mike. I'm holding out against hope that they're going to have the self-driving car there shuttling us back and forth from the parking garage or something <laughs> like that. Or maybe they'll drop it from a blimp or something like that. So that'd be great. If you could do that, Sergey Brin, that would be great. Thanks. Well, why don't we jump into the news. Speaking of Google and speaking of Google I.O., well, Google's Nest has agreed to buy the internet camera company Dropcam. Nest Labs, which makes smart home appliances like the Nest Thermostat and the Nest protect smoke detector was acquired by google in january and has run semi-independently sam colt is a tech reporter for business insider and joins us to talk about this acquisition welcome sam thanks for having me so they paid 555 million dollars is that too much for a company that makes little webcams well not necessarily if you think about what they might do with it uh long term i mean in the short term if you think about it as like a home security video play maybe it's not worth half a billion dollars but i think they're looking further towards um sort of internet of things applications where they might the wall street journal has suggested they might put video sensors on the cameras so maybe like you know these cameras see you and they start opening your doors when you get to your house and sort of that connectivity that we think about when we think about the internet of things Interesting. Now, a lot of people uh, over the weekend have been talking about this, and there's been a lot of cynicism and a lot of snarky comments, mostly around the idea that, oh, my God, Google wants to put a camera in your house and, and spy on you and monitor you 24-7. Is that completely unfounded? Is there even a shred of legitimacy to that, uh, that instinct? Well, if you look at uh, the way that uh, Nest made the announcement, they were like, this is a this is not a Google buy. This is a Nest buy, even though obviously, like, we all know the relationship between Google and Nest. Um, so I think a lot of the cynics saw, saw it as a Google buy, whereas Nest was trying to emphasize that it's, you know, it's their product that they're acquiring. And I think they're trying to get away from some of those some of those some of that cynicism that you were just referring to. Sam, um, Dropcam will abide by Nest's privacy policy rather than Google, so right? I I think so. Yeah, as far as far as I know, sure, yes. And I, so I've that's been, an interesting. I've been curious about this whole thing about oh, it's not Google, it's Nest. I mean, what happens is that companies negotiate for an acquisition, and they negotiate all kinds of terms. What happens to the founders? What kind of money they get? How long they have to work there? How long they can't talk to other competitors about the product after they leave? There's a million things that they go over as part of those negotiations. And one of them are promises like, we're not going to do this, that, and the other thing. You can run it semi-independently. And then when they announce it, they, they talk about those terms. And in this case, uh, Tony Fidel and the whole Nest, T Tony Fidel being a former Apple person who's one of the lead uh, uh, founders of of Nest um, talked about being super independent and not really being controlled by Google, but we kind of know that that is only temporary. Google owns the company. They, you know, five years from now, three years from now, two years from now, the, Google can pretty much do anything they want. Tony Fidel might not even work there. The founders might be gone. They may just decide to fold it in entirely to, you know, under under Sundar Pichai, like everything else. Um, so, is it really legitimate to say, "Oh, this isn't Google. This is Nest"? 
Oh, no, I think that's their line. I totally agree with you. Um, I think, you know, uh, down the line, we could to we could see this technology used in a way that maybe we don't want it to be used in. Um, and that this is, it's all about the optics of the buy right now. They don't want people to associate it with Google because of some of the bad connotations there. Um, but, you know, it is functionally bought by Google. So I think you're absolutely right. To me, the biggest reason to not freak out about the idea that a company that Google owns is buying a company that makes cameras for inside the home. And also in Twit, by the way, if you want to go search to search Google for Twit drop cams, you'll find all the cameras that are in the studio uh, going 24 seven. But the biggest reason is that we've already got theoretically Google software controlling cameras pointed right at us right now. I've got a laptop in front of me and I've got Google Chrome open um, and there's a camera in the laptop pointed right at me. When I pull out my Android phone, that's another Google product with a camera pointed at me. We've got Google cameras theoretically pointed at us all the time, and we have to kind of trust that it's not being hacked, that it's not being used to, to spy on us and that sort of thing. I really personally don't see the difference between a drop cam owned by Google, even if it's owned by Google directly, and using a laptop and Chrome and you're using an Android phone or something like that. We expect Google to not spy on us without our knowledge or awareness. Um, do you agree with that or am I missing something there? No, I think we do expect Google not to spy on us. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, when we buy an Android phone, we don't expect that, you know, Google's going to tap in and watch what we're doing. Um, and I think that's a re obviously a reasonable expectation as a consumer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And have you used drop cams yourself? Um, uh, have you ever tested them or, or reviewed them or used them personally? You know, no, I haven't used them personally. I think they're really neat. Um, I think they're, it's a technology, you know, they've got like two, I think two basic models, I think, one for just under 200 and one for around 150. And I think it's an interesting technology. Um, you know, right now they're used a lot for home security so that you can check on, you know, your house while you're not there and, and that sort of thing. Um, and a lot of people are buying, you know, they also have a, on the side, they have this like video cloud storage service um, and a lot of people are, I think something like 39% of their buyers are actually buying into this service as well. So there's a cloud storage component um, as well that, there are, that Nest is also getting when they're buying Dropcam. It's not just the, um, the products themselves. If you're watching the video, you're looking at the Twit Brickhouse Dropcams. Jason's cycling them through, through, through these cameras, and these are all live, of course. And they're really great. I, I often check in, see who's there, or watch what's happening in the studio while we're doing a show or whatever. It's, it's a lot of fun. Now, um, now, Sam, one last thing. Uh, in addition to cameras, of course, uh, Dropcam makes something called Dropcam tabs. And what they are, super easy to use little motion detectors that you can put on doors, windows, and other things, and then you can associate messages. You, you create the message yourself. So, for example, if you put it on a door, uh, on the back door of your house, uh, you can tell it, say, okay, the back door just opened when motion is detected on that device. You can put it on your laptop and say, somebody stole my laptop as soon as it moves, whatever. You can do whatever you want. And this, I believe, is what, uh, what Nest Labs really wants them for. They're good at taking things that have kind of been around for a while in a, in a, in a format that has been for experts and, and hardcore enthusiasts, and then making it super warm and fuzzy and easy to use and bulletproof for ordinary consumers to use that. Um, so I'm guessing that this is about that sort of technology. And of course, the cameras are the same way. I've been trying to use uh, different kinds of security cams and, and home webcams like this for years. And there's always problems with the networking and Wi-Fi connectivity and all that, all that kind of thing. And so, so I think they're really after the warm and fuzzy home automation expertise that they have more than like, oh, we want to put cameras in there and everything. I definitely agree with you. I think that it's an automation play. If you look at their aesthetic, it's almost like Apple-esque. It's very minimalist. You know, if you look at some of their their uh, their press photos and their you know even on their website, which you were just on, um, I think it's you know they're trying to look sort of appealing and sort of benign, and the way they do that is by looking very minimalist. But uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think it is about you know home automation, not necessarily about home security. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Uh, Sam Colt is a tech reporter for Business Insider and is available at businessinsider.com and also S-C-R-A-N-E, Colt. And the only person we've ever had on the show who's named after a pistol from the Old West. <laughs> you know, I'm related to uh, the Sam Colt who invented the revolver. So. Are you really? Wow. Yes, really. 
do you get free uh, free unlimited supplies of of, of guns uh, <laughs> for your whole life? Or? <laughs> I, I I wish I should ask them about that. No comment. No comment. You know here no here here in uh, here in the Bay Area, the the, the woman who uh, I guess she was the 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 uh, recipient of the vast um, fortune of what was the rifle company? Was it Winchester? And she went nuts and built a crazy house in San Jose. So anyway, I hope that doesn't happen to you. And I want to thank you for coming on Tech News today and uh, sharing your insights about the uh, acquisition of Nest Labs by Nest Labs of Dropcam. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. Well, in just a sec, we're going to talk about a little surprise coming at Google I.O., but first I want to tell you about Gazelle. A curious thing happens when you are a gadget freak like me and also like Jason and like all of us probably, which is that when you get the, the new hotness, it's the greatest thing in the world. And then over time, over the weeks and months, it's sort of the shine wears off. And after a while, you're kind of like looking at the new, new thing, uh, which is always better. And, of course, this year we're getting all kinds of great phones coming out throughout the rest of the year. So what do you do with the old phone? Do you just hang on to it? Or do you upgrade? It's, a, it's an important question. You don't want to be wasteful. You don't want to be excessive. Well, Gazelle makes it easy for you to, to sell your phone, get a really good price for it, and then that phone will be put back into service. So it's not being thrown in a landfill. It's not being wasted. It's actually good for the environment because somebody is going to use that phone. And it's super, super easy. You can't believe how easy this is to use. Just go to gazelle.com and find your item. Put in the condition, you know, it's good condition, bad condition, whatever it is. They'll even sometimes buy broken devices, believe it or not. And then they'll show you the price. That price is locked in for 30 days. So even if the value of that device goes down during those 30 days, they'll honor the initial price once you lock it in. So you want to do that right away. And then you get paid fast by check, PayPal, or my favorite option is the Amazon gift card option because you'll get 5% more for that option. They send you a box. They, inside the box is a little sticker. So you just put the phone inside the box. You put the sticker on the outside of the phone, and off it goes. And then you get paid. It's incredible. And, and again, you'll be stunned, I think. I usually am very surprised by how much they're willing to pay for your device. So easy and so good for the environment. you got to use Gazelle. Gazelle has, has paid more than $100 million to more than 700,000 customers and there are fast processing and no listing hassles at all so find out what your apple or android device is worth take a minute go to gazelle.com and find out and do it now because your device may lose value the longer you wait well sarah samsung's got a surprise for us at google io what are they cooking up right so we knew that lg and maybe even motorola was planning to announce a smartwatch at google io but it sounds like now samsung will come out with its own android wear device um to tell us more we have kevin tofel of gigaohm kevin this isn't by far samsung's first smartwatch right <laughs> not by a long shot not by a long shot i have here in my hand the uh the gear 2 uh, which came out earlier this year. It runs Samsung's Tizen software. Even before that, though, they had the Galaxy Gear, which ran Android, but they have since switched to Tizen. So right now, all of their watches run Tizen. However, as, as mentioned, uh, Samsung is an Android Wear partner, and it sounds like they are going to have a device to show us uh, this week with Android Wear. And you wrote about, if I recall, uh, earlier in the month, a, or maybe last week uh, it was, uh, some details from the FCC about an Android Wear device by Samsung. Clearly, this is uh, almost certainly the same device that we're hearing about today, right? That's correct. It, 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 I should say that's probably a very good uh, indication that Samsung will have an Android Wear watch this week. And it was, uh, I think, June 13th, the FCC database showed the Samsung SMR382 code name, whatever. Uh, it's going to be smaller than what we have here today, which is actually a very good thing because the gear devices are, they're pretty bulky. They're pretty big. They've got a camera in there and uh, it's just a bit much for Android Wear. Now, do you think that they're going to abandon their their sort of habit of having multiple platforms and multiple devices? I mean, right now, they're, I th believe they're on three or four platforms before they get into Android where, uh, you know, they're, they're running Tizen. I mean, are they going to drop any of these or are they just going to have a, a plethora of, of smartwatches on different platforms? If, if, Mike, if they chose one platform, they wouldn't be the Samsung that we all know and love because they love to play the field, as it were. Um, they constantly are, are pushing their Android devices out there with their own skins, their TouchWiz. Um, they've got Tizen now. The first Tizen phone was released earlier this year. They used to have Bada. I think that's probably what you're referring to. They're, they've tried all kinds of things. And 
you know, it's a smart play on, on Samsung's part to actually do that because why take a chance on something, uh, say a Tizen watch, when you can also have an Android watch out there that you know developers will, you know, glom onto because there will be several Android watches. It's a clever strategy. It's the one Samsung's been using, and I don't see them changing from that. Do you see them How coming out with a with a round watch? I mean, all of their watches and all of Sony's watches and many of the leading watches in this space for a, a while, a couple of years, have been these rectangular watches. Android wears a, a operating system that enables them to have round watches and everybody loves them. So I, I would expect Samsung to come out with a round watch pretty soon. It's very possible. Um, round displays are pretty difficult. It's not something that we, you know, currently have today in our consumer electronics. Um, Motorola is expected to have that with the Moto 360. They've already shown that off. I do expect that this week. Uh, the FCC images show a, a squared type display, kind of like what they have today. So I don't think we'll see anything round from them this week. But it would be smart of them to to consider that. And even their um, their gear, not their gear, their Fit um, Smart Band is a more rectangular type. Uh, display so it's not round but they're willing to try different different types of form factors so I could see them try a round watch soon how do you think Samsung's device would compare to LG and Motorola's smartwatches do you have a sense um, in terms of specs yet about what we're, we can expect this week uh, I don't have anything official obviously I mean I've heard lots of things probably the same types of things you've heard uh, my, my take is that you know, Android wears a platform, and in typical Google fashion, they're going to kind of say, here's the types of chips and sensors that you want to use with Android Wear to begin with. They could expand that later on and have different types of chipsets, but my suspicion is it'll be a low-powered Qualcomm chip that's the same across all the board for all these initial devices, um, and, and very similar functionalities as well. I think these will all look and feel and behave the same. The only difference is, as we said, the Moto 360 is round, looks more like a traditional uh, a traditional analog watch. So that's the, the differentiator there. But I really don't expect too, too much in, in terms of the way of differentiation on this first batch. Well, Kevin Tofel is a senior writer for GigaOM, and he's uh, you can reach him at Kevin C. Tofel on Twitter. Uh, Kevin, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Well, Google believes in distributed systems, and the company's lobbying effort is no exception. According to a piece in Politico by Tony Rahm, Google heavily lobbies not just in Washington, D.C., but also state legislatures and in city councils across the country. Sounds like a pretty massive effort. Tony Rahm is a technology reporter for Politico Pro and joins us now. Welcome, Tony. Hey, thanks for having me. How big is Google's overall lobbying effort in terms of money and lobbyists? <laughs> That's very hard to tell. We only know some of the numbers, partly because Google has such an expansive political operation and partly because a lot of states don't actually require companies to report the specific figures that they spend on lobbying. But a few figures we do know, Google spends more than $3 million each quarter to lobby here in Washington, D.C., and that's on everything from patent reform to immigration reform. They're involved in many states from New Jersey to New York to California to Missouri on a batch of issues, whether it's from protecting their self-driving car from regulation or ensuring they can build out Google Fiber. And they're a big political player as well. They donate millions of dollars every election cycle to candidates at all levels of government. So we're talking about a company that has immense political reach, and there aren't many others in the tech community that really have Google's political resources. So is Google kind of alone among tech companies in terms of such a wide scale of lobbying? Um, so it sounds like not many other firms are just this invested. You're absolutely right. There are a lot of tech companies that have a presence here in D.C., but a lot of them only got to Washington because they felt like they had to. And Google's included in that bunch as a company fresh off a federal antitrust investigation. But even Facebook, which is another major political player in D.C., doesn't have the sort of resources that Google now has. And there certainly aren't many Internet companies that play ball on the state level. There are some, you know, Facebook, for instance, lobbies in California, especially because California spends so much time looking into issues related to privacy and security. But Google really stands alone in this. Um, and they have plenty of reason to be out there. You know, with Google Glass, for instance, everybody's talking about Glass. We're talking about Glass. And so are regulators. They're concerned about what might happen if a, if a Glass owner puts on the spectacles behind a car, if that might lead to concerns about distracted driving. And so that prompts Google then to act to hire all these lobbyists and lawyers and to ensure that its technology isn't more regulated.
the way I look at it is that Google's always trying to push the envelope in all these different areas. They're always challenging users. Will we accept Google Glass? Will we accept self-driving cars? Will we accept all these, you know, balloons flying around and solar-powered <laughs> airplanes to deliver internet connectivity to remote villages in uh, in near Bakersfield, California? It's a, it's a it's a it's a they're constantly. I mean, this is kind of their business is sort of changing the users. Uh, and and it sounds to me like the lobbying effort is the is the legal arm of that. I mean, essentially, they have to go to these state governments and to a certain extent local governments to get to push through things that are challenging to 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 people to to citizens. Uh, do do we want self driving cars? Are those dangerous? You know, that's that's a difficult transition to make to go from a world in which there are no self driving cars to one in which we let computers drive cars. And so. You know, I can I can really understand why they need to do that. What I don't understand is what took them so long. I remember just a few years ago, Google was just completely ignored Washington, and uh, really didn't have a lobbying effort uh, of, of any significant size at all. And at some point, they woke up and said, "You know, this is uh, this is uh, totally worth doing." In part because the amounts of money involved in lobbying is so small compared to you know by Silicon Valley standards. I mean, this is a this is a an industry where a company might spend three billion dollars. Uh, to buy some trivial little app that they end up closing, and and yet you know three million dollars is what you're saying is is their lobbying effort for Washington D.C. That's it's a uh, kind of an obvious thing, and I would kind of expect almost all technology companies to follow Google's lead in this in this area and really lobby heavily, especially those that are kind of challenging people with new types of technology that that people might be uncomfortable with. Sure, you're right. It's a pretty complex thicket of issues here. If you're going to be on the vanguard of technology, you're going to be the one that runs into all of these legal questions. And that's what we're seeing with the self-driving car. That's what we're seeing with Google Glass. And we're definitely seeing that with Google Fiber as the company goes up against telecom giants. But there's another side to that coin, and that's government scrutiny. These companies, tech companies, tend to get involved politically when they find themselves in the government's crosshairs. For Google, some of that has been related to privacy, and we talked about privacy a little bit on the show today. Whenever its devices collect more information or you know, send chills up the spines of regulators and customers alike, the company is more likely to dispatch its lobbyists to ensure it's not regulated in how it collects and uses consumer data. For Google specifically, it's 2012 investigation by the Federal Trade Commission that it was acting anti-competitively really led the company to ramp up its operations here in DC. The dozen or so lobbying firms they hired in those years, they really never let go. They've just kind of stayed on the same pace since just a few short years ago. And that's sort of been the story for other tech giants as well. Far beyond Google, they tend to get involved whenever they feel like they have to. Facebook, when it faced its big, uh, privacy investigation by the Federal Trade Commission, it got more involved. A lot of tech players that didn't know where DC was on a map suddenly found it when SOPA was the big thing, if you remember the Stop Online Privacy Act, and still more have paid attention to DC as a result of the NSA and a lot of the controversy over government surveillance. So that's the other side of this. When companies feel like they might be regulated or they see a business stake in regulation, they tend to hit the gas pedal a little on lobbying. Yeah, good point. Tony Rahm is a tech reporter for Politico at politico.com. And you can find him on Twitter at Tony Rom. That's Rom with two M's at the end. <laughs> Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, Sarah, GM, speaking of uncomfortable technologies, GM's got something that uh, really is kind of weird and I don't think would fly in this country. What's going on? Mike, you're absolutely right. This is really kind of crazy. Um, this is a new Android app, currently a prototype from GM China that lets you text fellow drivers by scanning their license plates. So the developer says you can use this app to maybe ask a driver out on a date or ask them to move their car when they're blocking the way. Um, but obviously there's nothing to prevent users from using this as an outlet for road rage, for example. And, and Mike, anyone can contact you even if you haven't registered the app. So. Pretty what? obvious um, privacy complaints. What could possibly go issues? wrong? Yeah. yeah. Right. I wonder if you could automate road rage. So you could have sensors that if somebody cuts you off or something, it just automatically sends them a picture of your middle finger or something like that. I mean, there's got to be some way to, to, to customize this. You know, it was one of the um, interesting uh, aspects of the history of Kevin Mitnick, who's the super hacker who went on to become a security consultant uh, from, from one of his recent books, is that he was actually able to hack somebody who cut him off in traffic through the phone system in about two or three minutes through his super hacking skills and then tell him off, why did you cut me off, that sort of thing. And uh, and here, 
GM is sort of automating that process. It's a kind of a kind of a weird technology, but uh, I, I just don't see. I, well, first of all, I'm shocked that GM is the company behind this. I would I would expect this to be a private company that's doing something that nobody else is going to let them do. But uh, kind of a weird thing. Uh, so we'll see if that uh, goes anywhere. Well, the city of Chicago, speaking of weird things, will soon test light poles packed with sensors to measure air quality, light, noise, heat, wind, and rain. The most controversial feature, though, is that the polls will monitor the vast herds of humanity moving around the city by tracking their smartphones. And and Sarah Silbert, this is um, an interesting uh, uh, experiment. Uh, if you track people's Bluetooth, you're only going to get a subset of the users. So I imagine they're going to use statistical analysis to, you know, basically decide that only 10% of the people walking around have both a smartphone with Bluetooth enabled that can be measured. And therefore, for, you know, if they detect 100 people, that's really 1,000 people walking around. Uh, do you think this will fly? Will the public accept this sort of thing? What do you think? I mean, it's not the only example of this we're seeing. Intel um, is implementing something a bit similar um, with the city of San Jose collecting a lot of information. Obviously, as you said, the cell phone monitoring thing is the real um, clincher here. And it sounds like there won't be any identification of people. So that's something. Um, it also seems like there won't be any cameras. Yeah, no cameras involved. And and speaking of Intel, Intel is one of the companies behind this offering uh, technical expertise, as as is Cisco. Zebra Technologies, Qualcomm, Motor, and Motorola. So this is sort of a concerted effort by a lot of companies that are like, would like to see these sorts of sensors in lots of cities. And, of course, the benefits are enormous. They are saying that it will improve the quality of life because they'll be able to get really good real-time data about things like air quality, the amount of pollutants in the air, not just in a general sense, not just on a huge level, but in individual neighborhoods. And then they can zero in and identify what the problem is. Uh, for those sorts of things. It's going to start out with uh, uh, in July with about a, uh, eight uh, intersections on Michi Michigan Avenue. If you're familiar with Chicago, you're familiar with Michigan Av Avenue. It's a major street there. Uh, and then dozens more by the year's end, and they're expecting hundreds, uh, at least 500 over the next few years. And again, this is going to be a boon for researchers. And you know, I think I think this is a, a a very good thing. It's very good to have this kind of data and and apply this in a big data sort of uh, algorithm crunching way and improve the quality of life. Maybe they'll be able to improve traffic. Maybe they'll be able to improve uh, other things. And you know, without cameras, uh, I think that this is something that people should not oppose. And uh, it sounds like a good thing to me. Well, Sarah, uh, an interesting development in the world of home automation. Uh, once again, uh, what's going on with uh, Quirky? Yes, yeah, so Quir Quirky is best known for producing products invented by its customers, but now it's really getting into the Internet of Things. It has an offshoot brand called Wink, and it's about to launch an $80 Wink Hub that will allow connected devices to communicate over various wireless protocols. Uh, we'll also see, to go along with that, a smartphone and tablet app. Um, so this will let devices using various protocols such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Z-Wave uh, to communicate. Um, it's not necessarily alone, though, Mike, right in the space. Right, exactly. I mean, th this, is th th this is one of the biggest problems with the Internet of Things, uh, which is that how are we going to get standards? Who's going to step forward and be the leader in the standards uh, race? And so, you know, Wink is essentially asserting itself as a standard as a as a an all encompassing hub, but I have a feeling that they're going to get some competition from Google as well and other companies. Apple will probably have their own uh, solution that's similar. I mean, they've already started down this road, so it's going to be. I, I have the feeling that it's going to be a mess, but I I like the fact that Wink is is doing this uh, is being launched for this purpose because we definitely need leaders in this space. We need unifying technologies. Uh, so that it can be simplified for for users, but we'll see if this actually flies. And um, you know, I'm all, I've been impressed by Quirky. Quirky's like an awesome company. Uh, they take thousands of uh, ideas every week, and then they crank out and work on two or three of them, build them into products, and sell them on their catalogs. It's really great for inventors, at least the ones who they end up selecting. And so the fact that they're doing this, you know, they see a, a rapidly growing number of the home autom of the products that are submitted to them are home automation solutions. And if you look at the world of, you know, crowdfunding, huge numbers of those are home automation uh, and Internet of Things related products. Uh, right. So. That's really why uh, Quirky's getting into Internet of Things with this brand Wink. And it seems like they have a ton of partners on board. So um, 
all Home Depot stores pretty much are going to have Wink displays with partners such as Honeywell and Philips um, selling products from um, light fixtures to garage doors to smart locks. So they're really kind of making it as diverse as possible at this point. Yeah, it's very cool stuff. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this category and I hope they I hope they really succeed. Um, if you uh, have noticed, if you've if you've seen our sort of beta show, uh, which is called I'd Fund That. We've done two of them now. Uh, they're not uh, full-fledged shows yet, uh, but we're going to turn that show into a full-fledged show. We've we've seen a little bit of home automation uh, technologies coming through that, and so this is a an enormous space that I've seen recently. The Internet of Things is going to be a multi-trillion-dollar-a-year business within ten years or so. So it's it's a huge uh, uh, category and v fast growing. So we'll be watching that very carefully. And congratulations to Qwerty for launching Wink. Sounds like a really cool thing. Well, TNT fan Dale Sorensen writes in favor of mandatory kill switches for phones. And here's what he wrote. He said, well, first of all, he said, love the show and the change you made to the format. I watch every day. We appreciate that. Uh, I'd much rather live in a theoretical world where hackers might use a cell phone kill switch to brick somebody else's phone than the actual world we live in now where people are hurt and killed daily for their phones. A bricked phone can be unbricked. Alas, people who have been attacked cannot be unattacked. A 19% reduction in phone theft is hardly a huge decrease, as you stated last week. He's talking about me. I said that that was uh, that 19% reduction in, in iPhone theft was, quote, huge. Mandatory kill switches would stop nearly all cell phone theft violence. The possibility of some minor hacking mischief is trivial compared to the benefit. And even if hacking did occur, we can always learn and improve if a national kill switch system. As a New Yorker who rides the subway, I'm sorry to say you are doing a disservice to this debate with your oft-repeated straw man argument against mandatory cell phone kill switches. And I personally have not made up my mind uh, on this issue. Uh, I raise the issue of whether or not it's necessary to have man mandatory kill switches because that's the other side of the argument and we want to talk about both sides of the argument. Um, I would probably lean in favor of mandatory kill switches, but at some point you always have to ask, you, you can say, you know, we save lives for every new law. Maybe we, you know, lower the speed limit to 30 miles an hour. Maybe if the subway is so dangerous, we cancel the subway and, and, and make that illegal. You have to make trade-offs between safety and utility, uh, between safety and things that people do in everyday life. And so I, I do think it's an open question as to whether kill switches uh, are should be man mandated by law. Um, I suspect that they will be, and it probably will be overall a good thing. We had another uh, letter uh, another email a couple of weeks ago where somebody made the point that, you know, reusing a phone, uh, which kill switches prevent you from doing, is one use of a phone. Sometimes they just strip them from part, for parts. So I, I don't think that uh, mandatory kill switches will completely eliminate all phone theft, even if it was widely, uh, widely spread because there are other reasons to steal a phone. Well, Sarah Silbert, that is the tech news today. I uh, want to welcome you back. You're normally our Wednesday co-anchor. You're here on Monday uh, this week. And also Wednesday, which is your normal day, Leo's going to host because Jason and I are going to go to Google I.O. And Leo's going to host a special uh, tech news today that's focused on the Google I.O. keynote. And, of course, that will be early, uh, earlier in the day. That'll be 9 o'clock, I believe. Uh, we'll do an official announcement on that on our blog. So we will see you, Sarah Silbert next Wednesday. Well, Wednesday Sounds after next. Great. Is that right? Thanks for letting yeah. me start the week with yeah. you. All right. Well, thank, thank you for doing it. Uh, all well, right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. You can subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT and follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. We want your opinions and ideas, so send us an email at TNT at twit.tv or leave us voicemail by calling 260-TNT-SHOW. Also, don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.